So it is with uh, great pleasure that I am able to introduce uh, Dr. Nav Tangri. And uh, whilst many of you may know uh, Nav from uh, from all of his uh, different roles, uh, he is um, a a, a participant. A um, sorry, an active uh, nephrologist uh, at the University of Manitoba, um, and has been instrumental in our understanding of the clinical. Um, risk prediction and improving decision making um, for patients, for people around the world. He's been uh, the developer and validator of the KFRE equation, which you're going to hear more about, comma, and uh, plays an important role in both national and international uh, interfaces between laboratories um, and clinicians and decision making. Um, he, he trained in both Canada and in the U.S. with uh, Andy Levy at Tufts, comma, sorry, <laughs> felt like I do. Uh, and uh, we're really, really pleased that Nav is uh, coming to us now from University of Manitoba in Winnipeg. Over to you, Nav. Oh, thank you, Adira. So always very, very nice to be here. Uh, let me uh, share and make sure that uh, you see the, the right view, or do I need to swap? No, perfect. Perfect, great. So uh, I'm really happy to talk about uh, the topic today, which is every patient with CKD should be risk stratified. Uh, in this talk, I'll cover some updates on the kidney failure risk equation. I try to pick new data whenever possible. In addition, I'll actually spend a lot of time going over the statements from the upcoming KDGO CKD guidelines. While the guidelines are still awaiting their final draft, and these guidelines were led by Adira and Paul Stevens, um, they you know, the near final draft, the, the draft from public review uh, was released earlier this summer, and I'll pluck out some statements basically pertaining to risk stratification and then try to highlight those and cover some of them in my talk today. So here are my disclosures. So CKD care is largely based on GFR. And that's why, that's why we fail patients. I mean, it's a lot better than doing CKD care based on serum creatinine, because then you would really miss a lot of patients. But what happens when CKD care is based on GFR? Well, if you're a patient, there's a lack of personalized treatment. High-risk patients get undertreated, and often uh, you know, the reaction is too late. And low-risk patients are overtreated, and they may get unnecessary side effects. Something that we've shown again is that physicians are not using, there's better use in nephrology now because we've been talking about it for a long time, but outside of nephrology, there's really in primary care and endocrinology and cardiology where a lot of early stage CKD lives, there's no use of tools to evaluate risk for CKD progression. So everybody gets treated according to uh, whatever their GFR is. And that leads to sort of a one size fits all care model. What I mean by that, and I'll show it on a slide later from US data, uh, we have a similar slide in Canada, is that RAS inhibitor use, statin use, SGLD2 inhibitor use doesn't seem to matter um, what your risk of progression is. It just kind of is monotonic and spread along the EGFR or CKD stage. If you're a single pair or a commercial pair, um, there's a catastrophic cost of dialysis, which everyone recognizes, but there's this big cost burden of hospitalizations, emergency department visits, heart failure hospitalizations in particular, uh, that happens starting at stage one all the way out to stage four, a G4 chronic kidney disease. So um, a focus just on dialysis perhaps misses uh, all the costs that are avoidable throughout, uh, throughout CKD. And then it, finally, if you're a pharmaceutical company, they are now finally interested in kidney disease. Biotech, pharma, there's all these effective disease modifying therapies they have, but they don't reach high risk patients until it's late because high risk patients in early stages of kidney disease are under recognized. They're not, they're, it's, it's like they're invisible. And obviously the, the simple answer is they're partially invisible because we don't order albuminuria, but that's a, that's a year long, decade long debate. So my view is that a risk-based approach, if you start thinking about patients across a spectrum of risk that can transform CKD care. So we developed the kidney failure risk equation in 2011 and the last guidelines came out in 2012. At that time, there was truly insufficient evidence to advocate for a, for a risk-based approach to care. The whole field was just starting. And I think we're really fortunate to, to have the 2023 guidelines uh, dedicate 
uh, an entire chapter to risk assessment in patients with CKD. And it underscores the importance uh, that, the, that the guideline work group felt uh, that, that risk assessment has. So over the next few slides, I'm going to just go through some, some, some screenshots, some visuals from the guideline, and try to uh, put this all into context as we look out to clinical practice in 2024 and beyond. So first, let, just a reminder, the guideline will have statements that are level one or level two, and then they'll have practice points. Let's start with the guideline recommendations. Level one recommendation means we recommend. And what that means is that most people in your situation, if you're a patient, would want this. So maybe more than 80%, you know, kind of that 80-20 rule. And then for clinicians, it means that most patients, so more than 80% should receive the recommended course of action. And from a policy perspective, that this could be, that, that this is such a strong recommendation that it could be a policy or performance measure that you measure perhaps labs on or electronic medical records on. So, so it's so strong that it should probably be implemented by labs and EMRs. Whereas level two is we suggest, that means the majority, so perhaps more than 50% would want this recommendation, but some would not. Uh, and that different choices may be appropriate for patients and, and that there perhaps is some debate from a policy perspective. So that's just the difference between one and two. And the strength of evidence is A, B, C, or D. A is the strongest level of evidence, which could be many large randomized trials or many well-performed modeling studies in the case of risk prediction. And B could be you know, sort of one trial or one well-done trial or a couple of modeling studies. So just setting the stage there for 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B. And what are practice points? So the guideline has, um, has recommendations, but then it has practice points. I like to think of practice points. Uh, I mean, the definition is in front of you. Practice points have consensus-based statements representing the expert judgment of the work group. They're not graded. And they're issued when there wasn't a systematic review done. But in a way, I also think of practice points as a um, kind of a guide to implement the recommendation. So you have an overarching recommendation, and then you have a series of practice points saying, here is how we, the work group, thought you could implement this recommendation in your clinical practice. So, so they're not less important or a downgrade from recommendations. The intent is just different. So the guideline has, uh, I believe, five chapters, and and the, you know the first chapter is as measuring of kidney function, and then uh, the second chapter is risk assessment, and so on. But prior to that, there's a preamble, a sort of an overarching guide to the management of chronic kidney disease, and this figure, some of this figure, which I've copied here, uh, shows up in this overarching guide. So first of all, GFR less than sixty and ACR greater than three is uh, is evidence of chronicity. Something that's clearly new and perhaps the subject of another talk is there's a big importance on more accurate estimation of kidney function using creatinine cystatin. But I want you to read these four lines. So now the guideline says, once somebody has kidney disease, stage according to GFR and ACR, establish underlying cause, and in no way are we over, either underestimating or, or downplaying the importance. Cause is right there. So immediately after GFR and ACR, you have to know what the cause is. But after cause, what's new from 2012 to 2023 is estimate risk of progression, then initiate treatment. So estimation of risk of progression is now an essential part of the approach to the diagnosis and management of CKD. And that's a new thing in this particular guideline. So let's go on to the key recommendations and practice points from chapter two. So first, there's a recommendation. In people, with CKD state G3 to G5, we recommend using an externally validated risk equation to estimate the absolute risk of kidney failure. So let's unpack the statement a little bit. So first it applies to people with G3 to G5 because that's where there's much more evidence for risk prediction equations. Second, it calls for an externally validated risk equation. An equation that's developed in-house and only validated in-house on the same data set does not have the generalizability and the robustness to make it part of a recommendation from a guideline. So we needed equations that have been developed in one place and validated in another. And finally, we wanted you to go beyond the heat map because the heat map gives you the relative risks of kidney failure. 
green is like the lowest, lowest risk and dark red is the highest, highest risk. And those are all relative to each other, but that doesn't tell you the absolute risk for an individual person. So those are the three key components I wanted to highlight in this 1A recommendation, which means you should be doing this for more than 80% of the patients you see, and it has the strongest level of evidence. Now, what are the underlying practice points? The first three practice points refer to how you can use an equation to es that estimates the absolute risk. So first, a five-year kidney failure risk of three to 5% can be used to determine the need of of, for nephrology referral, in addition to criteria based on GFR, ACR, and other clinical consideration. So what this statement says is that an eGFR less than 30 is probably almost always a reason for referral. A UACR greater than 60, 70, 30, depending on the country and the region, is a reason for referral. And for that large heterogeneous people of CKD stage G3A and G3B, a five-year kidney failure risk of three to 5% can be considered as the cut point that helps you refer. And what are the other clinical considerations? Pregnancy, polycystic kidney disease, GN, lupus, all the obvious clinical things do not go away. Just like cause doesn't go away in the early part of the guideline, these clinical considerations for referral don't go, go away. But putting risk as a criteria for referral is helpful because it gets the referring doctors, the people who we're trying to affect the, the, you know, the primary cares, the nurse practitioners, the endocrinologists, uh, to start calculating risk and start ordering albuminuria. Second practice point. In Canada, we're really lucky to have multidisciplinary CKD care pretty widely. And that's thanks to people like Adira and Pat Parfrey and others. And a two-year risk of greater than 10% can be used to determine the timing of multidisciplinary care in addition to, again, other EGFR-based criteria and other clinical considerations. Now, why two years, 10%? It came from uh, the Ontario and Alberta experience, and I'm gonna show you some new data on the safety of this two-year 10% cutoff. Practice point number three. A two-year risk of greater than 40% can be used to determine education and timing of kidney replacement therapy, including vascular access planning or referral transplantation. Now, this is packing a lot of different information. I would argue that, uh, so first of all, these are practice points, they're different for each setting. So modality education could begin earlier. It could begin at anywhere between 10 to 40, but perhaps timing, including actual referral for vascular access should be closer to 40. And I'll show you some data from BC uh, done by I think Mohammed Atik in the Dira's lab uh, that's really, really excellent at showing the benefit of EGFR, of adding a 40% threshold to EGFR-based criteria. And finally, a note of caution that risk prediction equations like the kidney failure risk equation, which are developed for people with G3 or G5, are not really useful for earlier stages of kidney disease. I'll show you much later in the talk why. And the example is, is obvious. You have to think of a 50-year-old with a GFR of 80, and we'll get there. So what are these externally validated risk equations that, that you can use? There's the KFRE, the kidney failure risk equation, age, sex, GFR, and ACR. I'll go more through that. But there are three other equations that are externally validated. There's one from Kaiser Permanente, which includes systolic blood pressure, antihypertensive use, diabetes, and diabetes complications. Um, it's, it predicts in five years. It has a high C statistic in Kaiser Permanente. Um, it is usable, but it requires much more data, a whole bunch of ICD codes for diabetes complications. And uh, actually because of that, Kaiser Permanente actually switched to the KFRE. There is a nice score from Martin Landry uh, before he was doing COVID trials, uh, looking at sex, serum creatinine, albuminuria, and phosphate. Uh, also usable, also externally validated, but in a small number of patients. And finally, there's a European guide uh, score recently developed called the Z6 score, which uses creatinine, albumin, cystatin C, urea, hemoglobin, and ACR. I think as e cystatin C becomes more widely used, we do need to think more about cystatin-based equations. Perhaps the KFRE should also be redeveloped using cystatin. It's just we don't have data um, on cystatin C in large groups of people where it wasn't ordered for a specific indication. 
where it wasn't done in a biased sample where you thought that something was wrong with the creatinine-based EGFR. So you can't develop an equation on a biased sample. Uh, in Germany, where this was done, this was done in, in, in cohort studies where cystatin was drawn um, on an unbiased way. Everyone had a cystatin done. So this is also another equation that's externally validated. A minute on the KFRE, so as you remember, age, sex, GFR, ACR, now almost 2 million individuals, so this greater than 1 million is probably greater than 2 million. And in addition to this KDGO guideline, there's the Ontario and Alberta CKD pathways. And for a couple of years, the KFRE has been part of the UK NICE CKD guidance. And in fact, NICE had done a full health technology assessment and systematic review on KFRE, and that became very useful to the work group uh, as part of this guideline. It is also used by more than 100,000 physicians worldwide. When you look on an annualized basis, there's only 10 countries in the world where uh, people, somebody doesn't visit kidneyfailurerisk.com. So even in parts of most of Africa, all of Asia, there is use uh, when you look at an annual basis, and it's more than 100,000 physicians worldwide. There are also other sites now, one for the UK, a German one that's being developed, and a Spanish one and a French one, which have been developed by local investigators. Where are we going with all of this? So, so the idea, this is a fair picture from the guideline as well. You inadvertently muted yourself, Nav. Yeah, we do overhead announcements in our hospital. So I wanted to spare everyone the, the overhead announcement. Sorry about that. Uh, so I, I hope one day we stop doing overhead announcements for random things. So, uh, so our goal was to switch from an EGFR 30 to 60, less than 30 and less than 20, which are used for transition from primary care to nephrology care, nephrology to multidisciplinary care, and access and transplant planning to risk-based cutoffs of three to five, greater than 10, and greater than 40. So you start to see the roadmap here. We're moving from EGFR-based care to risk-based care. So now, new data, okay? So first, let's start with what happens in the chronic kidney disease clinic? So there's two provinces which have been doing this for some time, uh, Ontario and Alberta, where you enter the multidisciplinary CKD clinic um, if you have a, a kidney failure risk of less than 10% over two years. So Christine White and colleagues in, um, in Kingston did a study where they looked at all the people that were discharged when this was put into place and there were 337 in Kingston who were not discharged, 88 discharged from, for a non-KFRE reason, and 53 discharged for a low KFRE. And they followed them for a long time, so like five to seven years. And what they found was that of the 53 people that were discharged due to a low KFRE, over seven and a half years of follow-up, only two went to kidney fill, uh, require, kidney, uh, require kidney replacement therapy. When you express that uh, overall, it really became, it's not an incidence per person of 4% is deceiving because there's 397 person years of follow-up. It really boils down to, if you discharge somebody like this from your clinic, there's a one in a hundred chance that they'll eventually need dialysis. So providing further evidence that it's probably safe to leave them in nephrology care rather than multidisciplinary care from a renal replacement therapy or kidney replacement therapy perspective. Here is data from Alberta. So this is now bigger numbers because it's all of Alberta. So 1,465 people, 1,339 times out of 1,465, the doctor decided to follow the KFRE recommendation. And uh, that allowed 176 patients uh, to be discharged from clinic. And again, of those discharged, one out of 176 actually required a kidney replacement therapy. So, and, and those who stayed in, so the 1,105 that stayed in the clinic, 295 required kidney replacement therapy. So just making the point again, that if you follow the recommendations of the equation, most of the time, it's going to be very, very safe from a kidney replacement therapy perspective. Now, many of you have asked, um, that when you advocate or when you communicate risk to your patients, it can sometimes be challenging. And I would agree. The way these models were designed, they predict the probability of dialysis at a certain time. They don't tell you how many months you have to go. 
So Shi Chu at UCSF with Delphine Todd and other, Neil Po and others used CK DOPS data. So CK DOPS is a large DOPS based registry that looks at patients with late stage CKD, G4 and G5. And they compared the time to dialysis using KFRE thresholds here. So you see 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, and EGFR thresholds here, 20, 15, and 10. What you see is that the spread or the confidence interval between KFRE thresholds and GFR thresholds is almost always narrower for KFRE. So if you use a GFR threshold to estimate time to dialysis, you'll have a much wider interval than a KFRE-based threshold. And this is the figure uh, they put in this paper, which I really, really like. It's months to kidney failure per a certain threshold. Now, I, I love this figure, so but I didn't want to read the figure and guess where my patient is if their risk was 34%. So I asked the authors, and they actually sent me a spreadsheet of every single risk and what the median and the interquartile range was for time to dialysis. So sharing some of those with you today. So if your risk by the KFRE is 10%, exactly 10%, not greater than 10%, you have five years to go on average with a range of 30 to 104 months. Once it exceeds 20%, it's 43 months with a range of 21 to 74 months. Once you reach 40%, why do we say 40% for dialysis? Because it's two years to go on average with a range of 12 months to 41 months. That means one quarter of patients will start within 12 months or less. And that's where you want, that's why you want to be conservative in the cutoff, right? Because you don't want to miss a quarter of patients. Um, and it can take up to a year from the time you kick off the fistula process to have the fistula be ready to mature. Um, at 50%, it's 18 months on average with an interquartile range of nine to 32. And at 80%, which is very high, it's eight months with a range of four to 14. In incidentally, in Manitoba, at 80%, we start remote patient monitoring. So what we do is at 80%, we give you, we, or at least we offer you a, a device uh, with a scale, a blood pressure monitor, and ability to contact your care team via text, and you do an ESAS weekly uh, so that we monitor you remotely to make sure you don't start. So these cutoffs can be used for a whole bunch of clinical decision making, and this, this chart or this figure can help you estimate time. Now, getting back to the access issue, really, really important to highlight this, this data from BC. So this is based on the BC CKD registry, and uh, Mohammed Atik and, and, and Adira and others who are part of this team looked at what would happen if in addition to the EGFR-based referral for fistula, which was 15 to 20, you added a requirement for an AKFRE greater than 40%. What would happen is instead of 49, 58% would start on a, a permanent vascular access within two years from the modality selection date. And equally importantly, you'd have less futile accesses. So a, a fistula or graft was created, but patient did not start dialysis within two years. That drops from 31 to 18. To summarize, there's a 10% increase absolute in the proportion of patients who start with a fistula and a 13% decrease in patients who never use a fistula in the optimal period. Coincidentally, this is the exact same or similar finding, a similar magnitude of improvement, both on the good end and the bad end, that's seen in an independent cohort in Sweden in the SCREAM registry uh, done by Juan Jesus Carrero. And that paper is uh, in review and, and to, be, to be published shortly. So hopefully these last few slides have showed you the importance of um, how the KFR is entering guidelines that could be used in clinical practice and, and how it can be used for decision-making. So now let me go through some data visualizations. So how do you practically use the equation? So this is done uh, by Johns Hopkins. Uh, in Johns Hopkins, what they did is they worked with their EPIC programmers. Now, EPIC is in Alberta, in the entire province. Quebec has signed on to EPIC. Ottawa has signed on to EPIC. And for non-EPIC users, we've developed using CanSolve implementation dollars, uh, a free web-based app that you can bolt onto any EMR. Even if you're in your private office anywhere, you can use it and you can visualize the risk of KFRE in your entire population and on a per patient level. So this is a patient at Hopkins, uh, two-year risk 1%, five-year risk 4%, 
Um, and here is their use of ACE inhibitor, GLP-1, uh, MRA, GL sorry, GLP-1, MRA, SGLT-2, uh, and ARB. And it shows when the patient was on and when they stopped. So it's a really nice view right in the EMR uh, to show this. What have we done uh, on our site? So we built this web application. On our site, our most recent addition is we've added another drug. So we've we always had you know, your current risk and what you could do with blood pressure control, ARBs, SGLD2 inhibitors. Now we've added finerenone. Uh, so we've really added, uh, you know, trying to show this pillar of multi-drug therapy. So, you know, in the first part of this talk, hopefully I've covered uh, some of the new evidence on KFRE, some of the implementation uh, pieces of KFRE, and, and showed you how you could integrate it into your practice uh, to make better decisions for your patients and for your population. Now, what to do in earlier stages? Let's get to the early stage problem, okay? So here's a 50-year-old male with diabetes. This is the photo from the guideline, EGFR of 80, and a gram of albuminuria. So your ACR of 100 milligram per millimole. If you put that patient in the KFRE, their two-year risk of dialysis is 0.07%, and their five-year risk is 0.23%. If you use a progression equation, a progression equation predicts 40% decline in GFR or dialysis. So 40% decline, very, very meaningful. All our clinical trials are based on this. And for this person for 80, this means going from 80 to 50 in three years. So losing kidney function at 10% per year, very, very bad. And look at their progression risk is 10% in three years. That's very high, okay? Uh, so, the message here is do not use the KFRE as dialysis is not the appropriate outcome for earlier stages of disease. So what should you use? Well, you can use albuminuria and heat map, right? Possibly, that's what we can do today. And, and, and I'll say that even that is not enough in earlier stages, that you, may, you should probably use equations designed for earlier stages. Because when you look at the risk of 40% decline in GFR, in every single GFR or heat map based stage, there's 80 fold variability in risk of CKD progression. So here's a patient with G3A, A3. They could have a risk of 8% or they could have a risk of 50%. A patient with G4A1 could have a risk of 0.2% or 20%. So the range is just so wild that in each heat map box and just using albuminuria, there is substantial overlap and, and people are literally all over the place. So why does this matter? Why does picking early stage CKD matter? Why do you want to identify these people? It's because of this problem, okay? So you have a high risk patient by 50 year old with a GFR of 80. If they're progressing at five mils per minute per year, they'll be on dialysis at 64 and that's five mil per minute per year on RAS inhibitor only. If you get that patient on SGLT2 inhibitor and finerenone, now they're going at two mils per minute per year and they're gonna be on dialysis at 85, possibly never. So you have an opportunity to transform a patient's life if they're picked up early. And for a low risk patient, it doesn't really matter. And the reality is that these patients are not picked up early. They're only picked up when GFR is 30 to 45. By that time, the majority of kidney function is lost and the window to start effective therapeutics is narrowed significantly. So with that in mind, we developed new models. So we realized that the KFREs do not predict progression in earlier stages. We wanted to make new models for 40% decline in GFR or kidney failure, which is an FDA approved endpoint. We wanted to build models that use routinely collected lab data that don't require biomarkers, that are truly models that are, can be obtained everywhere. So our models are widely validated across clinical trials and representative US populations. I say US populations here, because they were developed in Canada. So of course they're valid in Canada. So we started out in 77,000 people in Canada, in Manitoba, validated in 100,000 people in Alberta, validated in 14,000 people in Canvas and Credence, 13,000 people in Fidelity, and 4.6 million US adults. Data that I'll present at ASN uh, in detail in an oral presentation, but I'm gonna share some, some of that with you today. So first let's talk about Canvas and Credence. So we scored 14,000 patients in Canvas and Credence and achieved a high AUC of 0.81 to 0.85.
In addition, we showed a 30-fold separation in high and low risk groups. The other cool thing we saw was within six months, the SGLT2 inhibitor group's risk started to drop and the placebo group's risk started to increase. So within six to 12 months, you could see a separation in risk. Uh, and then that continued at all time points. So what does this mean? I love this figure from the Smart C Consortium. This is looking at the absolute benefit of SGLT2 inhibitors per 1,000 patient years. So if you look at a person, the average person in the trials with a GFR of 46, you know, you have 11 CKD progression events prevented, 11 CV deaths or heart failure, um, four acute kidney injuries prevented for one ketoacidosis and one lower limb amputation. So I totally agree with this. I think it's a great population health approach. Um, but if you had the tools to individually risk stratify, what I would tell you is that at least for CKD progression, this 11 is a sum of people who have like a 50 to 100 per thousand patient year events prevented, and some people who have three to five per events prevented. So let me show you how. So this is data from our model in, in Canvas and Credence. If you take a high risk patient for our model on RAS inhibitors, they decline at negative 5.7 mils per minute per year. You put them on CANA and they go at negative 2.8, they have a net benefit of three mils per minute per year. You take an intermediate risk patient, the net benefit is 1.8 mils per minute per year. And if you take a low risk patient, the net benefit is 1.2 mils per minute per year. Now, let me make a couple of points clear. This is kidney disease progression. This is not all cause hospitalization where there's a clear benefit from SGLT2 uh, across any level of albuminuria or risk. But it does go to show and justify the things we saw in MPA kidney that everybody benefits from SGLT2 inhibition. Every single person, whether they're low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk, benefit from being on an SGLT2 inhibitor. But uh, the low risk patients benefit about 1.2 in slope. 1.2 is very meaningful, by the way. In case you're wondering, anything about 0.75 mils per minute per year means slowing to dialysis. And the high risk patients benefit three mils per minute per year. In fidelity, we had a major difference between using GFR ACR and our model. So at every year, we showed the same thing we saw in Canvas Accredence, but we had remarkably large AUC differences. So 0 0.66 versus 0 0.86, 0 0.59 versus 0.81, really showing the exact same thing in Fidelity in, with finerenone as we saw in Canvas and Credence. Here's another line from Fidelity, the overall AUC is 0 0.82, but again, what you see is the high risk group in Fidelity has a 40 to 80% risk of progression and the low risk group in Fidelity has a 0.1 to 10% risk of progression. So everybody benefits from finerenone, but the benefit is spread across the entire risk continuum. Now let me show you why for people with kidney disease, predicting progression is important. When you predict progression for kidney disease, not only do you predict progression, you predict hospitalization and you predict costs of care. So this is what we showed in 4.6 million adults. So our algorithm was more than 80% accurate in predicting 40% GFR in decline or dialysis. And when you looked at the top 10 percent of risk and the bottom 50 percent, you saw a three to five fold increase in all cost costs, 13 to 30 X increase in per patient per month CKD costs, which was driven by a five to 10 X increase in inpatient visits and ER visits. Here's some remarkable data from a health economic perspective. So this is a commercial U.S. population and this is Medicare, so it's older adults. What you see uh, is that on average, one in seven or 13% of high risk commercial patients had a hospitalization in baseline, and then it went to 14 in follow-up. When you looked at low risk patients, they were not far from 13 at 10, but then they went to four during follow-up. In Medicare, 16 to 25, low risk patients, 12 to seven. So the, not only do high risk patients experience more hospitalizations in follow-up, we're so good at finding low-risk patients also that low-risk patients actually on their own without intervention have lower hospitalizations and follow-up. And you see the same thing uh, on inpatient visits for all cause. So it, this is not just CKD. 
in Medicaid, so this is Medicaid, socially disadvantaged people, 16 to 20 for high risk, 12 to six for low risk. So it's really powerful to predict CKD progression in people with kidney disease because it drives hospitalizations, it drives costs. Another thing about uh, cost this time in Medicare, I'll skip this slide and get to this one. So what type of costs? So blue bars are inpatient and outpatient, orange is pharmacy or drug spending. So in Medicaid, which is socially disadvantaged people in the US, in high risk patients costs go up, in low risk patients costs also go up a little bit. So we're puzzled by this. So why are costs going up in low risk patients? Well, it turns out inpatient and outpatient costs were still going down, only drug spend was going up a little bit. But generally speaking, this is very powerful data to convince national payers and, uh, and private payers that predicting progression is important in kidney disease. And, and how do you predict progression? You predict it using algorithms designed to predict progression, but when you do it, you can find the patients that if you act on them, not only will you prevent progression, you'll prevent hospitalization and you'll reduce costs of care. So how are we implementing this, uh, this, these equations? I showed you KFRE data from visualization. I showed you our website. With these equations, we've designed a lab report. So here's a lab report for a high risk patient, 60% risk, 60 out of 100. We're doing this in collaboration uh, with, with, with the Roche and with Life Labs. Um, and you see here 60 out of 100 for this patient who's high risk. And you see a whole bunch of clinical decision support, which is totally mapped out to the patient's labs. Not only do you get the risk, you get a complete care map for the patient. Frequency of monitoring, what's the blood pressure, is the referral indicated, and what drugs should be considered. Now, these are lab-based models that, that, that I developed and we developed. And there are other models that have also been developed. This is a model for 40% decline in GFR, also externally validated using the CKDPC. Again, 1.6 million adults this time. So we're, I love that we're in the age where we're talking about millions. 4.6 million on the last model, 1.6 million adults in this, in this model, multiple cohorts. This time requiring not just labs, age, sex, GFR, albuminuria, blood pressure, medication use, smoking status, BMI, and insulin use. AUC from 0.74 to 0.77. So these are models to predict progression for earlier stages of kidney disease. What else is in the guidelines? There's a recommendation, um, uh, which is driven by amazing work done by a colleague and friend, Sean Barber, is, which says, use disease-specific prediction equation in patients with IGAN or IgA nephropathy and ADPKD. For cardiovascular disease, we want you to use models that are either developed within CKD or those that incorporate EGFR and albuminuria. And for mortality, use models that for mortality that were developed in the CKD population. I'm gonna spend one to two slides on each one of these models. And after that, leave us about 10, 15 minutes or so for discussion. So what to do when there's a disease specific model available? So we're very clear for diseases like IgA or ADPKD, you should use the disease specific model. And actually there are differences. When you, when you have ADPKD, the Mayo Clinic model is externally validated, works really well in external validation. Pro-PKD does not. So that's the one we would recommend. For IGA, the international IGAN model is externally validated, accurate across geographies and eras. And so for these diseases, that's what they should use. And for patients not with these diseases, KFRE or 40% decline models are appropriate for most. What about MACE? So important to know that, first of all, most patients with CKD have heart failure before they have stroke or MI. So I would say use MACE plus models um, and use MACE plus models that are developed in people with CKD. And we have developed one. It's currently under review at a journal. Uh, it uses age, sex, GFR, ACR, and a history of hemoglobin and a history of previous cardiovascular disease. We developed in Manitoba, validated in Alberta and Sweden, Hopefully it gets accepted soon because the moment it's accepted, we'll, we'll publish it on kidneyfiliarisk.com and you can use it um, to estimate cardiovascular risk for both primary and secondary events in this population. One slide about models to predict mortality. So we did build models to predict mortality in G4 and G5. 
Morgan Grams had built excellent models in G4 and G5 that show mortality, heart disease, um, uh, starting dialysis, death after dialysis. Ours are a little bit simpler, only require age, sex, GFR, ACR, hemoglobin, and albumin. And, but the key thing is it's hard to predict mortality. You'll never build a model for mortality, in my opinion, for all cause mortality that has an AUC greater than 0.75. That's because mortality, all cause mortality can happen from sepsis, it can happen from an MI, or it can happen if you're crossing the road and get hit by a bus. And so there's no single common pathway. And that's why these models are hard. So what should they be used? In my opinion, they should never be used to tell someone that dialysis is futile. That's really not, they're not that accurate. I, I would absolutely caution against that. In fact, they should be used to identify groups of patients only. So if you have a low risk group of somebody who's in their, people in their 70s who are not considering transplant because of age, maybe they should be considered for like an extended criteria donor list. And somebody should think, hey, this patient's mortality risk is actually very low. Uh, perhaps their biological age is in their 60s. Let me think about transplant. And if you're really high risk, maybe you have a personalized vascular access plan. Maybe you wait much later till a fistula or graft discussion happens. Maybe you have an earlier discussion of conservative care pathways, but not futility. A plug for one of our new models. Um, this is just a personal interest. You know, I used to see consults from urologists here for patients with kidney cancer, uh, you know, because they face a clinical dilemma, right? They have kidney cancer, they have a localized mass. Should they have a partial nephrectomy? Should they have a radical nephrectomy or should you just watch? And actually patients and urologists both are concerned about kidney failure. And, and this probability of kidney failure is influential in their clinical decision-making. So we built a model, an externally validated model like we always do for the risk of dialysis following kidney cancer surgery. Has age, sex, GFR, ACR, we always have these four in all of our models, diabetes, and the type of nephrectomy, partial or radical, developed in Manitoba, validated Ontario, and now we're validating in six countries, uh, Europe, North America, Asia. And this is already available at kidneyfailurerisk.com. So if you go to calculators, you'll see kidney cancer risk equation. So, so if you have a patient that you see in your clinic who has kidney cancer, um, and, and is considering surgery, you could go through this probability with them. Our next validation, this study, we're really gonna try and publish this in a urology journal. This was done in AJKD because we think urologists also need to be aware that they can accurately calculate the risk of dialysis following surgery. Two last slides, key take home messages. CKD in 2023, just like in 2012, is staged by a combination of both EGFR albuminuria and determination of cause. CGA is still very, very important. But staging is only the beginning. Determine cause and risk stratify. Risk stratification must follow. You can now calculate the risk of kidney failure for all patients with CKD using our website. We can provide you tools that have been supported by CanSolve uh, you know, to, to do this for your entire clinic population. For earlier stages, you can now calculate the risk of CKD progression. And why are we doing this? Because high risk patients need high intensity therapy and they need it earlier, not later. So how do, why do we need to do this in practice? And what's the key last connection? Because there's models and then there's implementation. And to implement, you need to overcome clinical inertia. I, you know, my view is that it's very easy to treat a patient after they've had a heart failure hospitalization and after they've already progressed to a GFR of 30 to 45 because they've declared themselves as progressor or heart failure. The key is treating patients who are high risk before they have those events. And, and to do that, we need to recognize high risk patients and we cannot do that in our heads. A multivariable risk is not, doesn't compute. And now we have disease modifying therapy. We have highly effective disease modifying therapy. So we must treat these patients to maximal risk reduction, advocate for better market access to these therapies and discuss polypharmacy. We're going to a pillar-based care approach in nephrology. We are gonna have, I am fairly confident that GLP-1s will likely be positive also. So we'll probably have three, four pillars of disease modifying therapy. And, and let's remove the non-disease modifying drugs and, and prevent kidney failure for a lifetime in high-risk individuals. Thank you.
Thanks. That's like a wow talk for a Friday morning. Um, so that was really fantastic. Uh, thanks very much there. Uh, Thank you. Um, Daniel Schwartz, uh, I um, asked whether we could get this into Promise. We're working on it, Daniel, so we will be able to get this um, available in the near future. Thank you, Nav, for a really outstanding talk. And again, I think taking us as nephrologists into a different era where you know, we pride ourselves on the complex physiology that we understand, but we have not embraced the whole notion of sophisticated risk prediction to help us manage our patients better. Um, I will remain a little bit nervous about the fact that many of our clinics are, when we don't have primary care physicians, also helping with education and are a bit of a basket for some of the lower risk people. But that's probably a longer philosophical conversation. There are a couple of questions. One is uh, to just uh, ask a little bit about the eight variable KFRE and whether or yeah. not there is an additional value of implementing that. So in people with the CKD three through five, if you have all eight variables, you do get slightly more accuracy with the eight variable equation. Um, because patients who have metabolic acidosis, hyperphosphatemia uh, tend to have probably worse tubular function than people who, who don't have those complications. The challenge has been that we just don't get enough, it's purely an implementation thing. So I think if uh, in, your implement, in your EMR or in your uh, lab, if you can implement a set of rules saying if all eight variables are available, do eight, and if just four are available, do four, that would be, that. that's how I would go. Uh, but often it's hard enough to get labs to, to, to do one or the other. So for simplicity, we had stuck to saying that labs globally should implement a four. Yeah, and a corollary question that Mark also is asking is about the, how do you see incorporating uh, polygenic uh, risks and novel biomarkers into these tools? And I guess, you know, if you already have an AUC of 0.85, yeah. it's pretty hard to get better. It may be important for families and individuals, but it's interesting to see, like, how can we do this in the multiple lab systems and with the different data that we have? Yeah, so so I think that's a, it's a really excellent point. And I, I totally agree with you, Adira. I think the AUC ceiling is quite high. And I think, uh, to me, um, polygenic risks and novel biomarkers are going to fill in the 10% the edge cases where people have, uh, you know, uh, so so in African-Americans, knowing APOL1 status may be more helpful based on conventional markers. In people with uh, a very pro-inflammatory state, I mean, we're doing IL-6 trials now, right? Uh, we're doing anti-inflammatory drug trials in CKD. Perhaps in those patients, inflammatory biomarkers may be, uh, may be, may be more helpful uh, uh, to, to, to find who will benefit. So I see them as filling out all the edges. And I'm, uh, in terms of modeling, I've always been a generalist. So I build generalist tools and I rely on like, you know, precision medicine people to fill in the, fill in all the edges. Yeah. I know, great answers. There are some adjunct questions, um, yep. but I know Sean's got his hand up. So let me switch to a live question and then I'll go back to some of the others. Go ahead, Sean. <clears throat> thanks, um, thanks, Nav. That was a great talk. and. Um... I'm uh, secretly jealous of what you've been able to accomplish in risk prediction with such large data sets. So, so that, that's great. We obviously have overlapping research interests, but um, uh, you've done great work uh, over the years. Um, I guess I'm wondering the, uh, the case example you gave of the 50 year old male. Yeah. Uh, hypothetically, you know, what if we change that to a 75 or 80 year old male? Because yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that one of the big issues um, we face in nephrology is being overwhelmed with low risk referrals and then losing bandwidth to focus our efforts on the higher risk patients. And so, you know, in, in an eight, 75 or 80 year old male, the, the concept of a 40% reduction in GFR is probably not all that relevant because there's really a competing risk of death, you know, with a limited lifespan. And so you do kind of want to be able to quantify what is the risk of, of dialysis, mostly so that you can identify low risk patients who really don't need to be seen by a nephrologist so that we can focus on, on higher risk patients. So how, how do you perceive that working in terms so, of identifying low risk patients, but, but with that preserved GFR with a dialysis outcome? So let me, uh, Sean, let me th I think of it really in two ways. So I, I think for earlier stages of kidney disease, I, I don't want to get into a dichotomy between nephrologists and non-nephrologists. I think we build tools to find high risk patients and ideally whoever their doctor is intervenes in the right way. Right. So I think, 
a referral is is uh, is, is such a uh, is such a thing that's so different in province to province, country to country. That what we should be doing is making it so easy uh, for other physicians to treat our patients with commonly available drugs. So if they, as long as they can recognize that this patient is high risk and they can treat them, that's good enough, right? I mean, there's nice data just this week from Alberta showing that nurse practitioners, for example, do just as good of a job as, as, uh, as primary care doctors and nephrologists for probably treating bread and butter, uh, you know, kind of chronic kidney disease. So I, I think let's, you know, get a little bit outside a referral. The second thing that payer data is really compelling for is that even these older adults who are high risk for progression, even in Medicare Advantage, where everybody has to be over 67, tend to have a lot of CKD related adverse events and heart failure hospitalizations, even if they don't go to dialysis. So I think the nice thing is that the RAS inhibitors, the SGLD2 inhibitors, and the MRAs of the world prevent both CKD progression and heart failure hospitalizations. So even if they don't go to dialysis and, and they don't get to that really later stage, there's probably a whole bunch of other benefits that are happening, even in treating older adults for uh, with, with the right therapies. So, so that's kind of my bias is really trying to stay away from referral and focusing on primary care endocrinologists, preempting the next question, internists and cardiologists. Yeah, so I think that like that was the next question was around um, these equations living yeah. in the nephrology world. And I know that you're doing some work with the labs and I think it's something that we're yeah. gonna try and tackle in BC, but get like the labs have a lot on their plate and it's not yeah. as you can maybe speak to how easy or not easy, but certainly an education program. Yeah. So I, uh, um, yeah, so it's an excellent point. And I think that the best thing I learned from participating in the KDGO guideline process was how important guidelines are to, to disseminating care. And even though um, we're all so busy with all the different hats we wear, I, I, I realized you know, what Sneed's question was, was extremely important. So when they asked me to sign up for the CKD chapter for the Diabetes Canada guidelines, I said in a heartbeat because and my whole goal in that entire chapter is to harmonize the Diabetes Canada chapter with the KDGO guidelines. Because I, I, I think primary care and endocrinologists do listen to Diabetes Canada guidelines. And uh, so I, I think a lot of work, which I really wanna do going forward is actually making sure that the hard work we put into these KDGO guidelines become the CKD chapters or the CKD content of primary care, diabetes, hypertension, like all the other guidelines, so that it's a consistent message to all physicians. Um, so both labs and guidelines are a part of that, I believe. Yeah, and I think, you know, just like internal medicine knows the CHAD scores, and so we would want eventually everyone to know our KFRE scores or our clin risk scores, because right. they're helpful no matter who you are. And I think you're right, right to in different countries and different healthcare systems, different physicians look after these patients and we can't be so siloed as to say like, not my problem. If, if yep. you're seeing them, that it is your problem. There is another question about um, the slope of change of GFR, including in risk prediction. I know this has come up a couple of yep. times over the years, so, so maybe you can tell people about that data. Yeah, so we've, we've looked at this in several different ways. So if, first of all, the value of slope is incremental. So the most recent GFR that you have is the most valuable GFR that you have for prediction. Um, so it's incremental, it is it is helpful, but part of the challenge is that you need about seven measurements over two to three years for slope to be reliable. Um, and uh, and often when we're seeing patients, now we're getting better because we have you know provincial lab repositories and such, so you can pull a history for a patient. But to, when you're thinking about, again, a generalist approach and making equations that are accessible to everyone, it's very hard to put in a variable that acquires a two to three year history. So that's that's the main reason why we don't include it. Great. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, that's a, I know that we, we often have tried to play with it, but it doesn't actually add as much as we intuitively think. And I think yeah. this is the nice thing. I am, and also I guess as AI develops, I mean, one of the biggest things is can you just speak briefly because oh we only have a couple minutes but like it getting this into a lab system is not as simple as many of us think is that correct yeah so i think from a, a regression equation like the kfre is not too difficult to enter into a into a lab 
because you, you know, labs are used to putting in regression equations like the EGFR estimating formula as a regression equation. So they can put that in the back. But the AI models and machine models, the LIS infrastructure is not built that way. So, so what you actually need to do to implement a machine learning model is you need to have a packet of data travel outside to a secure server. Then you need to run a whole bunch of processing scripts do a score and then have another API or another kind of pipeline, data pipeline, send the data back. So it's it's technically much, much more challenging than doing a regression equation. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, yeah. So we're out of time. I think um, that Sue just raises the point also about the changes in, of, in GFR that occur when you start new medicines. There's a lot in the guidance about that, in the guidelines about that as well, about what you shouldn't worry about. I think the education campaign is going to be really important, but the earlier we start, the better it will, it will be um, so that when things are available, people don't get anxious about things. But I, I did want to thank you very much for an outstanding talk, but I think importantly, an outstanding um, set of work that you've been doing to really try and improve our care using evidence that we have uh, and your uh, ability to get people to collaborate across different countries to really make sure that this is truly international is fantastic. So thank you very, very much for thank making you. the time. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you, we thank you everyone. We five at one yeah. point, so that's pretty good for a Friday morning. Yeah. Um, so thank thanks, you. everybody, again, and stay tuned.